This is a download from the BBC. To find out more and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk. Hello. Internet porn is everywhere, even on feedback. This week we'll be discussing whether the moral maze should have left that subject alone instead of talking about it in what some saw as too explicit detail. The producer, Phil Pegum, explains his thinking. It's an immensely sensitive subject, but it's a very important subject and one that people feel passionately about on both sides of the argument. Also, what do you think of this? Even more simply, can everything in the end be brought down to the influence of money? I'm rich! Beyond my wildest dream! Brave experimentation or car crash radio? The man behind Radio 4's recycled radio answers his critics. And there are plenty of them. It was a pointless rag bag. Was it made by children? We'll try and find out. And something is in the air in Borchester. And Jazza put it there. Is this a radio first? I said to a friend of mine afterwards, I think I've just made history, as well as wind. But first in feedback this week, the departure of Quentin Cooper, along with his programme Material World. It has continued to dominate our inbox. From next Thursday, in their place, Dr Adam Rutherford will be fronting a new programme called Inside Science, a sister to Inside Health. The editor of the Radio Science Unit, Deborah Cohen, explained why she'd made the changes. We felt that it was time to change our weekly science magazine programme to bring it in line with the rest of the science output on Radio 4. And we thought it was time to change from the programme, a programme like Material World, which is really quite celebratory about science, to have a programme that will look more into, question more, than the Material World does. Deborah Cohen talking to us last week. Having listened to her explanation, the vast majority of our correspondents still disagree with her. My name's Nick Clark, and I'm calling in from Bedfordshire. I was very disappointed to hear that the programme fronted so excellently by Quentin Cooper, Material World, was being stopped. Your interviewee said that he was being taken off to be replaced by something more in line with the rest of the shows on Radio 4, which I simply don't understand at all. I don't understand the reasoning. I don't understand why it should be more in line with everything else. Lastly, he was accused of being to celebratory about science, which seems to me to be, well, if it means anything, wrong. My name's Alan Kemp. I live in London. Material World's a great programme, one of my favourites, and I don't want to see it scrapped. If Radio 4 wants a new science programme with a different emphasis, why not run it concurrently with Material World for a year and see if they're both needed? Doing a great job for 13 years, as Quentin Cooper has done, must be the world's worst reason for getting fired. Feedback's a good programme. Roger Bolton's done a great job for some years. Look out, Roger. Will do. Deborah Kern does have some support from Steve Bell, for example. After hearing of the demise of Radio 4's material world, I thought I'd like to say that, to me, it's no great shame. The programme just seemed to be a vehicle by which Mr Cooper's massive ego could make itself known to a wide audience. No more will we have to hear pointless and irritating alliterations, rhymes and puns, which were broadcast, it seems, to emphasise just how very, very clever the presenter was. I very much look forward to hearing the replacement series. Material World may have been consigned to the great digital archive in the sky, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's gone forever. It could well crop up in a future series of Recycled Radio, which is currently on air at 11am on Mondays. As the name implies, the programme rifles through the archives and splices excerpts together under a particular heading, say money, or blood, or power. The programme blurb claims that those excerpts are then plunged headlong into the slicing, dicing and splicing of the edit machine before emerging afresh. Here's an excerpt from the excerpts. But it's not a Faustian bargain. You're in the lower order for some reason or other. Their satisfaction was only that of being alive. It affects your friendship, your life, your style, the school you go to. But it's not a Faustian bargain. So you got it firmly impressed upon you. Confused? Many listeners are. The programme does have strong support on Twitter, but on closer inspection, many fans seem to be radio professionals. Feedback correspondents have mostly given it the thumbs down. Hi, I'm Penny Lynch, calling from East Sussex. I love a bit of bonkers on the radio, so I hoped I'd be amused, surprised, inspired. But as it wore on after maybe the first ten minutes, I was hoping it would be a 15-minute slot, and, 
really disappointed to find that it was a half hour long programme, a really long half hour. Nick Orchard. Someone's being paid a good salary to decide this was worthy of our attention and someone has not earned any of it. It wasn't a bold experiment. No boundaries were crossed here except those of taste. Listeners weren't left thinking, that was clever, or, hmm, interesting to put Hitler next to Humphreys. I wasn't stimulated to consider anything anew. Hello, Roger. I'm Chris Jennison from Liverpool. It was a pointless ragbag. My ears would pick up a tasty morsel, and I was hoping to hear more of that programme. And I then felt cheated when I was subjected to a mishmash of disjointed sound bites. Was it made by children? Well, Chris, I can assure you that the producer of Recycled Radio is a grown-up called Miles Ward. I asked him what he was trying to do with the programme. Two years ago, I said to Radio 4, there's a lot of amazing voices in the archive. David Attenborough, Bertrand Russell, these are people who we could do something different with. So the first pilot I made was about the subject of failure, and it had David Attenborough talking about the dodo, It had a game show in which a person couldn't remember where the dodo died and it had poor old Nigel from the Archers falling off a roof. And the trick was, I suppose, you've got to make the connections yourself. The dodo is dead. Everyone knows that. The dodo bird was that lovely bird that knew no fear. Couldn't fly. And unfortunately it's extinct because it was so friendly people used to kill them and eat them. I I really thought I knew that. So much Radio 4 is a presenter telling you what to think. And I suppose the idea behind these programmes is nobody's telling you what to think, the dots are there for you to join yourself. Well, I think Penny Lynch, one of our listeners, wonders if there are any dots, let alone sentences. She says... Just sticking together bits of sound around a theme doesn't inherently create anything interesting. It's like being made to plough through someone else's scrapbook. It's all very nicely arranged and glued down, but essentially pointless and deeply tedious. I like the fact that when someone really doesn't like a programme, they write really well. I also saw a complaint that it sounded like something you might hear as punishment in Guantanamo Bay. There is an audience for this. The really interesting response was what was happening on the internet, and people were talking about this in a really extraordinary way. Who were talking about it? I mean, my impression is that a lot of radio professionals and people who love experimenting with with sound were delighted that such a programme was made, but that the general audience thought, whew, OK, but... It's difficult to talk in those terms. I looked up who some of these people were, and they're wearing suits and ties. They're not all working in soundscape. So we did a pilot, and Radio 4 said, do you think you can make some more? And if you do, can we have someone there as the audience's friend? What did they mean, do you think, by saying the audience's friend? Did they mean that if you switch on the programme after a few minutes and you don't know what's going on, you won't know what's going on by the time the programme's finished? Well, they come out straight after Woman's Hour, And if you suddenly go into this stuff, it can be, they thought, a little bit odd. So I think the network was right to say we need Gerald Scarf. He's kind of anarchic and violent and interesting and sets up the tone. My name is Gerald Scarf, your guide to the chopped up, looped up, sped up world of recycled radio. A kind of archive hour on speed. So an impressionistic work, if you like, still needs a frame. And I think there is a frame. So the money programme I played to a producer who works on the bottom line, she said... (laughs) If you lean in and listen, if you relax and engage, then you will get what's going on here. Well, uh, thank you very much for the moment, Miles Ward. Please stay with us. Recycled Radio isn't the only programme, of course, in the last year or so to attempt to shake up the more traditional documentary form. Wireless Nights is a late-night programme presented by Jarvis Cocker. Wow. I haven't seen a horror film in ages. I used to be petrified of them. found they gave me nightmares. Surely I've grown out of that. What do you say? Shall we give it a go? And we're joined by one of its producers, Lawrence Grizel, and by Radio 4 commissioning editor Mohit Bakaya. He commissions Shortcuts, an afternoon programme with short stories brought to listeners by comedian Josie Long. There's a piece of graffiti in the new town in Edinburgh that I often walk past, and it's on one of the beautiful old stone buildings, and it's been done by three children in permanent marker, and it says, Mark F., David C., Paul Clark, and then the Clark is really hastily, but not well enough to cover it. Mohit Bakaya, are you sure, as a commissioning editor, there is an appetite for these sort of programmes? Have you done any research? Well, we have done a lot of research. There's a group that I know you will have heard us speak about before, the Replenisher Group, typically the 35 to 49, so we're not talking about 12-year-olds here, we're talking about, you know, a kind of the, the younger age bracket of the Radio 4 audience. And we know that they are consuming Radio 4, obviously, but they're also consuming a lot of audio online. And now, because of the digital revolution, we're seeing more and more short-form stuff 
in podcasts and people are able to listen to a radio from America and other countries and they like it. And so we're trying to give them more of what they like. I mean, let me take, for example, Shortcuts, the, the programme I commissioned for the afternoons. What we're trying to do there is say we know that the audience is moving in and out when they're listening to radio and they're not available in the same way they might be in the evening or in the morning where they may be more static. They're often getting in and out of cars, it might be a school run or whatever. And so we thought... Is there a way of making shorter form documentaries so people can dip in and out and maybe get something out of them without necessarily feeling that they're having to leave programmes halfway through because they've got to go and pick up uh, the kids or whatever? But so there's a problem there, isn't it, sometimes? Because even if you put them into smaller size nuggets, if you like, those programmes, people c- could still be slightly baffled what's going on. To what extent do you say, I have to help them? We don't want to bamboozle the audience. I know our t- intention is never to confuse them, it's to delight them and take them on journeys. And sometimes what you need to do to do that is put someone in, as we did with Gerald Scarf and as Josie Long does on Shortcuts and as Jarvis Cocker does on Wireless Nights. I mean, in all cases, we haven't sought to just throw a load of audio on the air and let people kind of find their own way through. We're trying to help them through it, but we're hopefully doing it in an imaginative way and in a way which I think is consistent with what Radio 4 has always tried to do, which is be a broad church in terms but, of the type of radio it makes. But you know you're going to get resistance, aren't you? Because some people, if they haven't been prepared, haven't heard presentation announcements, just come into it. Do one. What on earth is going on? Look, I mean, there's a there's an there's an age old tension between commissioners like myself and program makers like Lawrence and Miles in terms of tr- how we best present programs to the audience. And I think we probably sometimes over row in trying to signpost stuff. And I think sometimes production over rows in trying to having their artistic head. And there is an, a natural and correct tension there. You can't make programs for everyone that everyone is going to love. What you have to do is make programs that you think are the best programs you can make and hope there are enough people who will love them. And well, in the me, case of these quote, three programs, pe- people do love well, them. Well, let me bring in Lawrence Grizel here, who's one of the producers of Wireless Nights with Jarvis Cocker, a thematic programme with short pieces woven together. It's just finished its second series. What have you learned from the first series and from the pilots about the way in which you can make these programmes, experimental programmes, more accessible to the audience? Well, I think that signposting is very important, which is the business of guiding listeners around what can be potentially tricky uh, material when you're interweaving three or four narratives. And I think as we are sitting there editing the audio, we are always thinking to ourselves, is the listener going to be able to follow this? Will the listener be able to differentiate these voices? And I think we decided Jarvis does need to say that say, for instance, the programme, the very first one we did, which is on a supposedly on a sort of transatlantic flight, Jarvis needs to say, we're going on this transatlantic flight, come with me, we're going to be looking out of the window and we're going to be looking down at some of the stories which are unfolding on the earth below us. Hopefully that sort of signposting says to listeners what you're about to hear is three or four different narratives. And rather than surf the in-flight movie channels, I thought we could eavesdrop on some of the real-life human drama back down on the earth below. And to what extent do you think that producers like yourself in the past have become too little interested in experimentation, that in a way what this is about is saying a lot of radio programmes are rather samey? No, I think the experimentation has always been there, and I think probably if you go back as far as the radio ballads, I mean, I'm sure that they were seen as experimental in their day. I think the reason why Wireless Nights started is that we felt that the number of short-form features on the network were declining. It's actually about perhaps the decline of an art form, that of the short-form feature. Can I bring Miles Ward back, who's down the line in Bristol? Miles, do you think your programmes and programmes like uh, the ones we've been hearing about will have a wider impact on radio producers? Or is this just an interesting experiment? It'll get over and back. We're to the <clears throat> bog-standard way of making radio programmes. Well, there's nothing wrong with the bog-standard way of making radio programmes, but Radio 4 should be putting on programmes that people really, really like. And I can say that, yes, people are talking about wireless nights and shortcuts and recycled radio, and it's sort of generated a conversation which can be no bad thing. Mohit Bikayam. I think if these programmes continue to be received by the majority of the audience in the way they have and continue to be as good as I think they are, then they'll continue. But I don't think there's any danger that they will 
you know, mark a revolution in the way we make the majority of documentaries on Radio 4 because there are important stories that we want to bring to the audience and at those moments sometimes the, as you call it, bog-standard way of delivering a material is exactly the right way to deliver that material. So, Well, I mean, the I, content coming first is, I think, what we're yeah, talking well, about. Well, c- content is king, of course it is, but if you listen to these programmes, certainly with Shortcuts and Wireless Nights, there are really interesting little uh, vignettes and stories about life in, in the UK, which are absolutely consistent with our idea of bringing new stuff to the audience and content being the most important thing. Well, for those of you who love a bit of bonkers on the radio, it looks like it will continue. Thank you very much to Mohit Bakaya, to Lawrence Grizel and to Miles Ward. Yes, I'll keep an eye out for you. Good night. And if you've got something to say about experimental radio, so-called replenishers, or indeed anything at all to do with BBC Radio, please get in touch. Nothing is off-limits, even this programme's presenter. And you set the agenda. After all, you are paying our salaries... You can write to us at feedback, P.O. Box 67234, London SE1 P4AX, or leave a phone message on 03 333 444 Standard landline charges apply, but it could cost more on some mobile networks. Or, of course, you can send an email to feedback at bbc.co.uk. All those details are on our website. And now... <laughs> It's that time again, a time to celebrate the most creative, heartfelt and inventive Tweet of the Week. And the winner this week is Bob Hawkins for his impassioned defence of recycled radio. And Bob's not a radio professional. Chop Radio 4. Mix and put back in a different order. Hashtag recycled radio shows that the sum is greater than the parts. A wonderful recipe. Thanks, Bob. So, if you hanker after the undying glory of having your tweet read out on Radio 4, please tweet your thoughts to at BBC R4 Feedback. And who knows, next week it could be you. Now, for what many consider the downside of the digital revolution, internet porn. So, for example, slut-shaming and revenge porn, where there is clear breaches, violation of consent, where material is posted yeah, on I'm the internet. Interested. I'm interested the, effect it has on people. the Moral Maze is not a programme for those who want a quiet life and don't want to be disturbed. It thrives on controversial issues and combative debate, never more so than in last week's edition, which tackled pornography on the internet, and it divided our correspondents. It's Michael Culkin, and I'm calling from Bristol at the moment. I thought it was an excellent programme, and it was wonderful at last to have some sensible adult conversation that didn't mince words and didn't fudge around the edges, but talk the real talk and put an end to that shrill minority squealing about how we should all behave. Kerry Davis does not believe she is either shrill or in a minority. I would like to say how horrified I was at the graphic content of this week's The Moral Maze. As a dedicated Radio 4 listener, the radio is always on, but when my grown-up daughter heard this discussion, she was deeply shocked. I also listened to some of the programme and could not believe the content was broadcast at 8pm. Of course, the subject matter is horrible, and it is only right that these discussions take place, but in such graphic detail and at this time of night, it was disgusting. Listeners Michael Culkin and Kerry Davis there with diametrically opposed views on the moral maze's handling of the internet porn debate. So why did the programme's producer, Phil Pegum, choose internet porn as a subject for his programme? We want to choose a subject that's in the public consciousness, that people are talking about and that's being covered in the news. But at the same time, we want to know that it's a subject with a strong moral and ethical dimension that we can explore. There'd been so much discussion about it, but we felt that there hadn't been the kind of discussion that we wanted to have about it. And it is, it's an immensely sensitive subject, but it's a very important subject and one that people feel passionately about on both sides of the argument. Why did you do it live? Because often in this case, people, uh, producers, BBC producers, when they're dealing with delicate subject matter, take the precaution of recording it, perhaps only a few hours before transmission. But that gives them enough time, if you like, to edit if there's a problem. You decided not to do that. Why? The Moral Maze has always been live, ever since it first started in the the mid-1990s. And you'll never break that? I don't think we will. It brings a certain 
element to the programme, and we like that live element. But granted it is live, therefore, you've got to brief. Michael Burke presumably requires no briefing, but your guests, interviewers on both sides, as it were, of the argument, need presumably to be warned about what they could and could not say. Did you, did you brief them about things they shouldn't say, words they shouldn't use? Yes, we discussed it very carefully right at the beginning of the editorial process when we chose this subject. You know it's a serious subject and you know that there are potential problems with it. So I discussed that with my executive producer and we inform Network Radio 4 that this is the subject that we're going to do. And then on the day itself, in the meeting before the broadcast, I talked to the panel and I said, it's an adult subject but it's for an audience that are intelligent and interested and want to hear a debate. But you have now to mention can... things. You have to mention things which most people, or a lot of people, will find distasteful. If you don't, then people don't know what you're talking about. So you have a duty, in a way, to be graphic, don't you? Or at least you have to be explicit. We have a duty to explore and, and inform for those people who want to hear about the issue, yes. And it's a question of judgment as to how explicit and how graphic you become with this subject. My conversation with the panel beforehand was that it's an adult subject. We are going to use some descriptions that some people might find offensive and it's unfortunate, and, and we're sorry for that. That's not the purpose of it. But people do have to, to hear about it, to understand why, why people are so passionate and concerned that some of this material is being viewed by young people. So when you start the programme, you're live, you're on air, what sort of things are you listening for? What are the sort of amber red lights that are around? In this programme, it's what kind of language is being used, in what context and how often. And we discussed it beforehand with Michael and with the panel and with the witnesses. And as a producer, you are ready to intervene if necessary. But with Michael being such a, an experienced presenter, he's often a, a beat ahead of you anyway, as was the case in, at one point in this. He was intervening before I could even switch the talk back on. What about talking about female supremacy pornography? What about talking about I, I think gay, we can, we can, lesbian, we can, we can, we can, even bisexual, radio, even, transsexual, even radio four BDSM can do without the, can do without the full catalogue. Melanie, can I just come a list of items like that can just become gratuitous, can sound gratuitous, and that's one of the key things that I warned the panel about and the guests as well that we can use some of this language, but if it's used repeatedly or gratuitously. Michael will stop them and pull them up. What about the case where Eleanor Mills, who was uh, one of the witnesses, used what some consider a swear word on the programme? Were you reaching for the talk back button to get Michael Burke to intervene? I wasn't at that stage, no. I mean, it certainly you do sit up and listen. I said pissed off on a breakfast telly show the other day and I got told off for that. And yet, as a kid, you can do two clicks on Google and see the kind of images that you would never have been able to come across except in maybe the sleaziest... Most in that context, it was clearly used as an illustrative anecdote and she was making a point in that context. She wasn't using it as an expletive to offend anyone and it was only ever going to be used narrowly in that context. And sometimes you have to pull your panel back a little bit. I remember your predecessor, Wantworth, walking in when David Starkey was on a programme, putting his hands around David Starkey's neck in an attempt, joking but serious attempt to get him to pull back. Do you sometimes have to suggest to your panellists that they pull back? I usually rely on Michael to do the restraining in the studio. He's far more brutal than I could ever be. <laughs> Finally, is there any subject you wouldn't cover? I mean, in principle, is there anything that you say, no, that's not our territory? When you choose the subject of the week, you do talk it through with the panel as well. And one of the key things is we've got to have disagreement among the panel. So there have been times when there's been a subject that I wanted to discuss, but if all the panel agree on the subject... It's a short we programme. ..we haven't got a discussion, <laughs> yes. So we do sometimes don't choose a subject that the listener might feel we should be discussing, and that's very often the reason. Phil Pigum, producer of The Moral Maze. And finally, I don't know what this feature says about Britain, but the story which has possibly generated more column inches, more tweets and more Facebook messages than anything else to do with Radio 4 this week concerns an exhalation. The moment in the arches when Jazza... Well, I'll leave it to Ryan Kelly, who plays Jazza, and to the acting editor of the arches, Julie Beckett, to tell you the whole sordid story. 
I didn't get to the scripts until they'd been edited, in fact. So I read it very fresh, coming to the scripts uh, when they were ready to go, really. And it just felt very realistic to me, very much in character. Three lads together in a tiny caravan. Come on, lads, lift up your glasses. May the sheep be plentiful and the wool be thick and long. To us. When I first read it, I pretty much thought the same as Julia. It's the sort of thing that could happen after Jazz has had a great big meal, after a day's shearing, quite easily. It's like those old films of the army barracks and things. and You, you didn't actually hear the sounds, but you'd sort of get the idea of what was going on. Right from the beginning, the uh, through the whole process, we all assumed that it was going to be audible this time to set the scene and put us there in the caravan with those boys. <sighs> oh, Jazza! In terms of actually sourcing the sound, Lisa, who's our studio manager, had lined up several different uh, ones for our producer to choose between. These are sounds that are coming from the BBC Sound Effects archive. So clearly the sound has been required before by the BBC. And she's lined up four or five samples and uh, the producer chose which one she thought was the best. I got to choose out of two of them as well. She sort of, which one do you think would you sort of, uh, yeah, that one, I think. That's probably the one you'd do, react to that. It's, yeah. <laughs> so quite a serious business, getting the right one. <laughs> Something rich and fruity. That's the sort of idea I had. The other one was a bit weak, so I just thought, no, I'll go for that one. I like that. Had several pints of ale, steak and potatoes and so on. Yeah, not something that's got plenty of body. <laughs> uh, better than in. Not turning the light off, lads. Yes. I said to a friend of mine afterwards, I think I've just made history, as well as wind. Because I've listened to the archers since I was about 12, and I've never had anything like that in it. Now, in terms of it being the, the first fart ever to appear on the archers, well, of course, we can't be completely sure because we have a marvellous archive that goes back across our 60-plus years. Uh, but, of course, they didn't record things like that in the early years. However, there was one inaudible fart, we believe, in September 2005 when Bert and David were sharing a trailer. And David referred to Ruth later, saying that the atmosphere was rather rich in the trailer the following morning so you know that's rather oblique we've been a bit more courageous this time i've had messages from friends in america i just had a text message from my cousin in tenerife this morning i just think it's amazing that people react i think it's very funny most of the text messages i've had have been sort of jokey facebook things and you know they've all been sort of nice one i've had a couple that said you know it's a pity it wasn't linda snell but it was <laughs> Well, you can never tell how a story's going to go and how what the reaction will be to it. We've been in the press over this, and, of course, social media take it all over the world very quickly now. So all of a sudden we find we, we've got a, a fart gate in the arches. So there you have it. After Watergate, Monica Gate, Camilla Gate, another gate that has rocked the establishment to the core. Let's shut it. Goodbye. Brave experimentation or car crash radio. The man behind Radio 4's recycled radio answers his critics. And there are plenty of them. It was a pointless rag bag. Was it made by children? We'll try and find out. And something is in the air in Borchester. And Jazza put it there. Is this a radio first? I said to a friend of mine afterwards, I think I've just made history, as well as wind. But first in feedback this week, the departure of Quentin Cooper, along with his programme Material World. It has continued to dominate our inbox. From next Thursday, in their place, Dr Adam Rutherford will be fronting a new programme called Inside Science, a sister to Inside Health. The editor of the Radio Science Unit, Deborah Cohen, explained why she'd made the... rest of the shows on Radio 4, which I simply don't understand at all. I don't understand the reasoning. I don't understand why it should be more in line with everything else. Lastly, he was accused of being too celebratory about science, which seems to me to be, well, if it means anything, wrong. My name's Alan Kemp. I live in London. Material World's a great programme, one of my favourites, and I don't want to see it scrapped. If Radio 4 wants a new science programme with a different emphasis, why not run it concurrently with Material World for a year and see if they're both needed? Doing a great job for 13 years, as Quentin Cooper has done, must be the world's worst reason for getting fired. Feedback's a good programme. Roger Bolton's done a great job for some years. Look out, Roger. This is a download from the BBC. To find out more and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk. Hello. 
Internet porn is everywhere, even on feedback. This week, we'll be discussing whether the moral maze should have left that subject alone, instead of talking about it in what some saw as too explicit detail. The producer, Phil Pegum, explains his thinking. It's an immensely sensitive subject, but it's a very important subject, and one that people feel passionately about on both sides of the argument. Also, what do you think of this? Even more simply, can everything in the end be brought down to the influence of money? I'm rich! Beyond my wildest dream! Will do. Deborah Kern does have some support, from Steve Bell, for example. After hearing of the demise of Radio 4's material world, I thought I'd like to say that, to me, it's no great shame. The programme just seemed to be a vehicle by which Mr Cooper's massive ego could make itself known to a wide audience. No more will we have to hear pointless and irritating alliterations, rhymes and puns, which were broadcast, it seems, to emphasise just how very, very clever the presenter was. I very much look forward to hearing the replacement series. Material World may have been consigned to the great digital archive in the sky, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's gone forever. It could well crop up in a future series of Recycled Radio, which is currently on changes. We felt that it was time to change our weekly science magazine programme to bring it in line with the rest of the science output on Radio 4. And we thought it was time to change from the programme, a programme like Material World, which is really quite celebratory about science, to have a programme that will look more into, question more, than the Material World does. Deborah Cohen talking to us last week. Having listened to her explanation, the vast majority of our correspondents still disagree with her. My name's Nick Clark, and I'm calling in from Bedfordshire. I was very disappointed to hear that the programme fronted so excellently by Quentin Cooper, Material World, was being stopped. Your interviewee said that he was being taken off to be replaced by something more in line with 